Thunder Force was one of the greatest shooting series of the 16-bit era. If you grew up playing the Mega Drive, whether a fan of shooters or not, you knew Thunder Force. Genre-defining graphics, fast and furious gameplay, and some of the best music in a video game. The series rightfully deserves its place as one of the best on the Mega Drive. But what do you really know about Technosoft? besides being the developer of this classic series. Among other excellent games like Herzog's Y, Elemental Master, Hyper Duel, and more, did you know that one of the founding members went on to work on groundbreaking games like the original Gran Turismo, or that two of their main staff who worked on Thunder Force 2 and 3 left the company to found their own team of Thunder, creating both Gate and Lords of Thunder for the Turbo Duo, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So in this history, not only will you get to enjoy the nostalgia of what made their games so memorable and revered, but also an inside look behind the scenes with some revelations you may not believe. I interviewed one of the most knowledgeable sources of Technosoft history alive today, a gamer and collector who curates a historical Technosoft page dedicated to the company a Technosoft geek like nobody else, with connections to former staff and a story to tell. Some stories that I still can't tell in respect to those involved. A living encyclopedia of their games and history, so it was an honor to finally absorb and distill that knowledge into what I hope to be the definitive, untold history of Technosoft shooters. No discussion of Technosoft should begin without Katsunori Yoshimura, a pioneer in early 3D and shooting games. Programmer of the original Thunder Force in 1982 that started the series, a free-roaming, top-down, scrolling shooter. Destroy all the shield generators for the boss to appear. Rinse and repeat, all to the soundtrack of William Tell's Overture. Evil, I know. How does that not get stuck in your head? But while it may seem a bit crude compared to what came after, it was quite a feat for its time in 1982, especially with the construction add-on that allowed you to create your own levels as well. Yoshimura-san was a pioneer in many respects, always pushing the boundaries of what could be done in a computer game, later creating Plasma Line in 84, the first ever polygonal 3D game. Yoshimura-san was a complex genius, eccentric, private, and had a complicated relationship with the world around him. And like most innovators of his caliber, no single company could ever satisfy or contain that ambition. He left Technosoft in 1984 to form his own company, Arsis, and shortly after became Kotori Yoshimura, possibly the first openly transgender game programmer in history. Shortly after her departure from Technosoft, her company Arsis continued to develop groundbreaking games, innovating with Wybarn, considered the first role-playing shooter, combining run-and-gun, shooting, and real-time action role-playing with open-world exploration, polygonal FPS gaming in 1985. Again, quite a feat. Three years later, she innovated again with Star Cruiser, a fully 3D first-person RPG, years before games like Wolf 3D and Doom hit the scene. Not only did it contain FPS combat, but also had open-world exploration along with dialogue and cutscenes to advance the story. Yoshimura-san was later known for contracting with Polyphony Digital in developing the first Gran Turismo game, assisting with the physics engine that would become the series' claim to fame. They also contracted with Polyphony for Omega Boost, a very cool and highly underrated 3D space shooter. But despite Yoshimura-san's departure from Technosoft back in 1984, her influence with the original Thunder Force game would be felt into the next generation, with its eventual evolution into Thunder Force 2.
Technosoft was bringing in some incredible talent. Enter designer Tsuzikawa Osamu and programmer Fukuda Izumi, the duo that would eventually turn Thunder Force into a household name. First released for the powerful Sharp 68000, then ported to the Mega Drive as a launch title. It took the original overhead concept created by Yoshimura-san and combined it with a traditional side-scrolling shooter while updating the graphics and music to a new level. Without a doubt a superior game to its predecessor, with solid scores from EGM Magazine upon release. It was the beginning of what most know as Thunder Force today. It introduced a standardized weapon system that continued to be used for the rest of the series, as well as claw satellites that orbit your ship, providing more firepower and acting as a shield. And as a game that tried to take the original formula and improve upon it for the 16-bit era, it was an excellent first entry. The original Sharp Port was a really tough game, and while it was toned down for the Mega Drive release, it still got really difficult in the late stages. It also couldn't keep up with the Sharp in terms of graphics and background effects. But despite the cutbacks, it was a great port and well received by the fans. So well in fact that in an interview, President Tomio Ozono talked about fans sending in cards and letters, praising the graphics and music as better than anything else on the Mega Drive. Enjoying the music so much, they were buying the OST. Mega Drive port was no slouch in sales, vastly exceeding the PC market at the time, solidifying Technosoft's move into console gaming. But what many don't know is that after completion of Thunder Force 2 for the Sharp, designer Osamu-san began to work for Technosoft under his own new company, first called Sea Rays Production, and continued to work under contract for them on their future Mega Drive ports. So the graphic design for Thunder Force 2 Mega Drive was done under contract, as well as the first sales behemoth of the series, Thunder Force 3. If Thunder Force 2 was a great start with a lot of potential, 3 blew it wide open and became a true smash hit for Technosoft. Now developed from the ground up for the Mega Drive, it deserved every bit of praise lavished upon it. While the overhead view was innovative, it wasn't a hit with all players. Technosoft asked fans to return suggestion cards included in the game, and many noted the overhead gameplay as being their least favorite, and Technosoft listened. So in a way, the direction of the entire series was influenced by players and fans of the second game. Thunder Force would now be a pure STG, fast-paced, no frills, shooting action, all development time poured into making the game look, sound and play like the best of the genre. The uneven and occasionally excessive difficulty of Part 2 made way to a much more accessible Part 3, a shooter for console gamers that even non-shooting fans could enjoy. To this day, it remains a truly great game for beginners to pick up and play, while some magazines and more experienced players criticized its difficulty. I believe it was that very accessibility that made it so popular. It was the kind of game that showed all Mega Drive owners how accessible and fun a well-made shooter can be. Death no longer resets all your weapons, only the one you were using. A speed select was added to adjust across various stages and layouts, where the screen not only scrolled forward but also backward, diagonally, and in almost every direction. And the starting stage was now selectable across five different planets. Yamanishi-san scored the majority of the stage tracks in the game, along with some of the endgame and boss tracks. Anyone who grew up playing this first, truly great Thunder Force can't help but shed a tear to some of these nostalgic tunes. Thunder Force 3 was such a hit on the Mega Drive that Technosoft decided to release an arcade version of the game, Thunder Force AC, not a direct copy but an upgrade for the System C2 arcade board. 
replacing two of the Mega Drive stages with new Space Ruins and Temple stages. The latter reimagined from the same level in Thunder Force 2. The graphics were given a slight boost and the music remixed. Technosoft even had the arcade version ported to the Super Nintendo. Unfortunately, it wasn't done by Technosoft directly, and without that same mastery of the hardware, it didn't quite live up to the same expectations. It suffered from slowdown, typical of early SNES shooters, and the music didn't have the same sound or punch that it did on the Mega Drive. It was a decent game, however, and better than many give it credit for, with one standout feature being a reimagined and great-looking battleship stage, replacing the one in the original version, along with some other minor changes throughout. But here is where things get interesting. After the completion of Thunder Force 3, Chief Programmer Fukuda Izumi left Technosoft to join Osamu-san at his company and formed a team they unofficially dubbed Kamenariman, which translates to Thunder Gate, one of two large entrance gates in Japan, leading to the famous Sensoji Temple. And instead of continuing to contract more games for Technosoft, they began working on a title for Hudson Soft and Red Company. By absolutely no coincidence titled Gate of Thunder to release on the PC Engine Duo. Basically a Thunder Force game for Hudson and near equally outstanding at that. So if you ever wondered why Gate of Thunder seemed like a Thunder Force clone, I'll bite a great one. Now you know. Gate of Thunder sold well for Hudson, so of course they were contracted yet again for the next game, Lords of Thunder. Yes, it was the team of Izumi-san and Osamu-san that designed and programmed both games, two of the very best on the PC Engine. And with their success and company growing, in 1994 Osamu-san founded CA Production, or CAP for short, where they created two of the most technically sophisticated games of the generation. First, Hagane, the final conflict for the Super Nintendo. Then, the equally infamous, Ginga Fuke Densetsu Sapphire for the PC Engine arcade card, Thunder Force 2 and 3, Gate and Lords of Thunder, Hagane and Sapphire. This dynamic duo truly earned their unofficial title of Kamenariman with some of the best games of the generation and still exists today with Osamu-san as the CEO. With such incredible talent moving on, how could Technosoft ever do the series justice in the next installment without the chief programmer and designer on board? Well, as it turned out, lightning did strike twice. And as hard as ever. Technosoft doubled its staff to compensate, with the remaining experienced members the core team trained by porting the amazing pinball game Devil's Crush to the Mega Drive in 1991. Originally developed by Compile for the PC Engine, it was meant as a first test to see how well the new team could work together. Sega was also flying high on Thunder Force 3's sales success, and the idea of an even more breathtaking sequel was enticing. While in the process of testing an upgraded development kit, the SNAS M2, Sega needed a Japanese company with a mastery of the Mega Drive hardware, and Technosoft was just that company, giving them a huge advantage in pushing the system to its limits. While this last bit of information is verbal only, and never corroborated or confirmed in writing, it's still an interesting look into the inner workings and close relationship between Technosoft and Sega. Starting with the source code of the excellent Thunder Force 3, double the staff, double the development time, and spurred on by owner Tomio Ozono, notorious for his hard-driving approach and demand of the highest quality. The team worked two long years on turning Thunder Force 4 into the masterpiece it became. So what made Thunder Force 4 a masterpiece? just about everything. 
The music by Yama Nishi-san is arguably the best of his career, with a combo of metal and rock ballads that took full advantage of the Mega Drive sound chip. If there was one constant at Technosoft through the early years, it was Yama Nishi-san's music, and Thunder Force 4 is worth playing for the soundtrack alone. Equally impressive were the graphics, some of the best the Mega Drive had ever seen, with more parallax, effects, and stages that popped with creativity. Thunder Force 4 was full of set pieces and extremely fast gameplay, along with an increased difficulty from the previous game. The enemy patterns are thoughtfully laid out, with many areas requiring both memorization and skill to master. The weapons return improved, potent and well-balanced, with a need to cycle them regularly depending on the stage and section. And the levels themselves are now multi-tiered, taller affairs where you can navigate a level using various routes giving everything an open, wider feel. The latter half of the game introduces the Lightning Saber, a charged blade attack that's so powerful it literally pushes you backwards when used from the inertia. There's so much going on screen that slowdown becomes obvious during the busiest and most graphically demanding moments. It was renamed Lightning Force Quest for the Dark Star for Western release and infamously misspelled in the process. But it's not enough to ruin what's otherwise a sublime shooting experience. Sega's supposed gamble on Technosoft paid off, with a game that became symbolic of the Mega Drive's prowess. Thunder Force 4 was Technosoft's final original Mega Drive game, but it wasn't their only series, nor their only shooter. All the way back in 1990, shortly after their release of Thunder Force 3, another team completed their work on Elemental Master, an incredibly cool, ground-based shoot-em-up. It combined familiar aspects of the Thunder Force games like forward and rear fire and a constant cycling of weapons, along with another legendary soundtrack, one Yamanishi-san was particularly proud of. You choose your first four stages, slowly grow your magic arsenal, acquiring a new weapon after each stage, until finally becoming a magician badass toward the end, with powerful attacks for every occasion. Pressing and holding the fire button releases a super attack unique for each weapon. Elemental Master used environmental hazards and limited ground space to craft what many consider another top-tier game. It was average and challenge to appeal to a wider audience of players. The bosses were another standout feature, large and creative, and it's a game that no fan of Technosoft should miss. Another extremely important and even landmark game that can't go without mention was Herzog's Wife. Instead of a shooting game, it was one of the earliest prototypes for what would eventually become the real-time strategy game. While it wasn't nearly as complex as the games that eventually followed like Doom 2, what it was is a heck of a lot of fun. A fast-paced PvP assault on the other player, using your base and ship to build units. Drop them off around the map and take out their base before they do yours. Terrain was important, with only certain units being able to traverse them, and only the weak ground soldiers could actually take over opposing mini-bases around the map. Unlike many future RTS games, you played a much more active role in the battle yourself, often taking matters into your own hands and whittling down their forces on the ground in mech form. As usual for Technosoft games, it was accompanied by a great soundtrack. Many have fond memories of playing Herzog's Y against a friend for hours, including myself. It was the first addicting RTS-style game that many of us remember, and mighty impressive for their very first original Mega Drive game back in 1990. Absolutely groundbreaking for its time.
Thunder Force 4 marked the end of an era, the 16-bit era for Technosoft. Aside from Namco's Starblade, a game Technosoft ported to the Mega CD, they turned their focus to arcades and the 32-bit era, the first of which was HyperDuel. Headed up by the same team that worked on Thunder Force 4, HyperDuel was the project of Nasuke Arai, an unsung hero of the Technosoft team. Arai-san had actually been with the company since its founding, being the chief sound designer and programmer. His mastery of the Mega Drive hardware made it possible for the effects and music to sound as amazing as they did. He was eventually promoted to general manager of development, and headed up development of the game for both Arcade and the Saturn. HyperDuel plays more like Thunder Force 4 than any other game in the series, which makes sense given it was by mostly the same team. It streamlined the weapon variety by combining them into two separate forms, where you can play as a traditional fighter or transform into a mech with higher damage and directional shots at the expense of mobility and a larger hitbox. The ship speed and gameplay is fast as in Thunder Force 4, with the improved hardware eliminating any slowdown from the game making some of the bullet-dense sections and bosses of the game quite tricky. Only having two shot types, along with a bomb attack by holding them together, simplified the gameplay into a more arcade-friendly format. But the biggest takeaway is that HyperDuel is an incredibly fun game, more arcade-like, yet on par with the Thunder Force games, and is highly underrated. The graphics are gorgeous, and the set pieces and bosses are vintage Technosoft. You do get the choice of three pilots, each with their own sets of power and speed ratings. And to make up for the lack of weapon options, you're offered small guardians that play alongside you, shooting down enemies until they're destroyed. HyperDuel was also the Technosoft debut of Hyakutoro Tsukomo, who became the main composer going forward, creating other masterpieces like the incredible soundtrack for Thunder Force 5. While the arcade sound hardware was originally limited, Tsukomo-san completely remixed and remastered HyperDuel for the Saturn. The Saturn port had both the arcade original and Saturn mode, with slightly improved graphics and some minor adjustments to the gameplay but most importantly, the upgraded music, making it the best way to enjoy the game. It was originally named Buster Gear, but for copyright reasons couldn't remain as the title. HyperDuel sadly never left Japan and now sells for outrageous prices, but is a game that no fan of Thunder Force should miss experiencing. The mid to late 90s was a difficult time for many Japanese companies, especially those that specialized in STGs. Despite some excellent games being released, the genre's popularity was already in decline. Many legendary companies like Toaplan, Rising, Compile, and Technosoft suffered through hard times and low sales. Even Cave, with their amazing releases and popularity, catered to a niche market, never able to realize the kind of sales that existed just a decade prior. Technosoft diversified during these years, releasing other genres for both the PlayStation and Saturn. But despite their attempts in some well-done games like the unique and underrated Neketsu Oyako, none of them saw the kind of commercial success as their Thunder Force series. STGs were Technosoft's bread and butter, and the Thunder Force series their flagship Two Thunder Force Gold Packs were released in 1996, the first covering Part 2 and 3, and the second Part 4 and AC. They also worked on another STG as a stopgap to the next Thunder Force, titled Blast Wind. Originally slated as another arcade release titled Inazuma Saber, it was confirmed to see three test locations throughout Japan, but never officially completed, with PCBs extremely rare. Instead, it hit the Saturn in 97 as Blast Wind. It was clear that it was made with the arcade in mind, with very short levels and a focus on scoring versus completion. It featured multiple routes for the stages, allowing you to fine-tune your scoring run and experiment with different routes. Again, Tsukomo-san contributed an excellent soundtrack, giving the game a familiar Technosoft feel despite its vastly different gameplay. And it was a good game, still worth playing today, along with being another expensive, 
rare Saturn collector's item, but in 1997, the 2D graphic style had lost ground to the rise of 3D. Its lack of standout graphics and ability to differentiate itself resulted in disappointing sales in an already failing market. Of course, Technosoft had no intention on giving up on their flagship series concurrently working on Thunder Force 5, with previous games meant as additional profit in the interim. In July of 97, the next Thunder Force finally released for both the Saturn and PlayStation. Following the market and Sony's insistence on 3D games, the next installment would be the first ever polygonal 3D Thunder Force. Technosoft went all in with Thunder Force 5. It had the biggest budget of any game they ever developed. The pinnacle of Tsukomo-san's compositions with an amazing soundtrack that could rival Part 4. Large, multi-phased bosses and 3D spectacle in every stage. No expense was spared to try and make this the best Thunder Force yet. Opinions will vary, but what isn't debatable is that it was a sequel worthy of the name. The lead up to the finale, launching into orbit with an upgraded arsenal, blasting your way through an armada of ships before shedding your armor and battling the Rhinox with your own upgraded arsenal from Thunder Force 4 is still one of the greatest moments the series has ever seen. The weapon system saw the introduction of a bold new option, the free range. Incredibly powerful but unidirectional, it changed up the strategy, needed to maneuver it into the right positions, and when properly deployed, it was immensely powerful, making short work of most enemies and shorter work of most bosses. And despite the somewhat rough nature of the early 3D, the art design shines through with some really great touches. Using some modern tech, like I'm doing in this footage via emulation, it's possible to clean up upscale and get the game looking as nice as ever. It was a great new Thunder Force game with amazing music, solid gameplay, and released on multiple platforms, both in Japan and abroad, with the biggest budget in Technosoft history, yet despite being a game that truly deserved better, likely through no fault of their own, sales were poor. With most gamers looking to play Resident Evil or Tomb Raider, the market for such a big budget shooting game was no more. And a game that deserved more love and should have fueled a return to form for Technosoft ended up being the beginning of their end. Over the next two years, Technosoft continued to release more games, from sequels to their PlayStation RPG Neo Rude series, to sims like Kumitati Battle, but Thunder Force 5 was their final shooting game, and none found the same success they would need to remain in business. By the end of 1999, the company was no longer able to pay their staff, and by June of 2000, sale of company assets and equipment began. 21, a data processing company, bought the rights to their assets, and by July of 2001, Technosoft finally closed their doors. This is <laughs> Technosoft may have been no more, but Sega had other plans. Two years prior, designer Tez Okano was working on a secret game, a satirical RPG sim where you're tasked with saving a struggling Sega from losing the console market, and Technosoft 
had a part to play. Toward the end game, you pilot a ship called the R720, Thunder Force style, taking out old Sega consoles like the Mega Drive and Master System. And of course, it was developed by the Technosoft team. The greatest irony is the game's release to an already failing Dreamcast console that would fold shortly after. But the games lived on in infamy as a must-play for Sega fans. The Thunder Force section was also re-released and upgraded in 2005 for Sega Ages Mobile, but that was only the beginning of Sega's future with the Technosoft license. One little known fact about Technosoft is they produced, edited, and distributed their own CD soundtracks, going all the way back to 1988, as they were always proud of their great compositions. While 21 owned all the rights and began selling their CDs and soundtracks in 2008, that same year, Sega licensed the rights to try their hand at making their own sequel to the Thunder Force series. Azu Matsuoka, one of the original Thunder Force members, was brought on as director of the project. Multiple big composers like Tamayo Kawamoto of Rayforce fame, Go Sato from the Raiden series, and Motoaki Furukawa of Gradius were brought in, along with the staff familiar with shooting games to help ensure it was well put together. The biggest criticism upon its release was the lack of originality. Many of the stages and sections felt like a rehash of previous games, although those who claimed no originality at all likely never saw this monstrosity of a final boss, one of the most disturbing big bads in a shmup. The music was well done, but too laid back for a Thunder Force game, not really featuring the hard-driving tunes of its predecessors. And although the 3D work was well done, it was simply a competent game with a lot of homage to the original. But with other amazing games like Treasures Gradius V on the PS2, it remained an average release that was somewhat forgotten, during a time where most gamers were looking to play other genres instead. Around the same time, a small doujin studio also took their stab at reviving the franchise with their own release, Broken Thunder, along with a history that's far more interesting than the game turned out to be. It was originally based on a music album back in 2001 of the same name, composed by the amazing Hyakutaro san It was meant as a music-only tribute CD. In 2005, it was re-released along with arrangements from other Thunder Force games called Broken Thunder Project Thunder Force 6. Only instead of it making its way into that game, it became the soundtrack for the PC game Broken Thunder. It was an incredible soundtrack, worthy of the series. Even a spectacular anime intro was created, better than anything the series had seen to date. Unfortunately, that's where the positives ended, as the game itself was half-baked and a disappointment, quickly pulled from shelves with the promise of a fix, a fix that never materialized. But the incredible soundtrack lives on. Flash forward to 2016, at the Tokyo Game Show, Sega announced that it acquired all intellectual property of Technosoft, paving the way for future releases. From the earliest days in 1980, when Technosoft was still Sasebo Microcomputer Center, making PC-based games like Snake and Snake on FM cassette and Donkey Gorilla, an unabashed Donkey Kong clone, it's hard to imagine them becoming a 16-bit STG juggernaut. They made so many more games than anyone truly knows, many during the early days, before the Thunder Force series even existed. It was the arrival of the brilliant Katsunori Yoshimura that cannot be overstated. Both his innovation and that of other early contributors like Yuichi Toyama with his own Herzog and Feedback games are what set Technosoft on the path of developing top-tier content. You may recognize the name Yuichi Toyama, who went on to join Compile and later rising true legend in the industry. So the question must be asked, why did so much great talent come and go through Technosoft? Why did so few stay the distance, creating such turnover in their ranks? The 
answer lies in the owner, hard driving president Tomio Ozono. His demand for performance on all levels was ruthless. A perfectionist where good enough or mediocre work would never suffice. And it often put him at odds with many of the employees. Technosoft was not known for its workplace environment. Many employees were poorly paid, even on the Thunder Force teams, leading some of them to take second jobs to make ends meet. Other employees were fired on a whim if not meeting his expectations. According to longtime Technosoft employee Nasuke Arai, this demand by Ozono, coupled with a shy personality, made it really difficult for him to properly express his gratitude for a job well done, leading to many misunderstandings. Speaking of misunderstandings, many wonder what's the deal with the two names. Is it Technosoft with a CH, or Technosoft with just a C? Simple really, the answer is both. It began when owner Tomio Ozono was registering the company, and misspelled it, inadvertently adding the H he didn't intend. Now that it was the official name, he had to run with it, even on their headquarters. However, it wasn't their preference for good reason. Native Japanese saw a CH and pronounced it Techno. So to counter that, they started removing the H, making it more obvious that it's pronounced Tekuno, and used it that way in most company ads, box art, and CDs. Once their games released out west, they used Technosoft with a CH for all western audiences, but continued to use it without the H for Japan whenever possible, and all due to an early misspelling on registration. But despite these negatives, there are always two sides to every story, also showing the fun and lenient side of the company. Playful credits and nicknames were common and would change them up regularly from game to game. Composer Toshiharu Yamanishi used the nickname Funky Seronin, and this fine gentleman calling himself the Booby Master in the credits of Thunder Force 4 may never have his true identity ever revealed, possibly for the best. Surely a workplace without some leeway would have frowned upon such things. Technosoft also had their own team of gals, aptly named the Technosoft Gals. Not only did they present a pleasing front for the company, showing up in all kinds of ads and events, even taking part in some of the development, such as lending their voice to many of the games. But they also handled the fan club, calendar, and related merch. Not every development house was full of good times and party central, like Toa Plan, and many well-known successful companies, including developers like Compile, had their own share of issues and employee turnover. It was more a sign of the times, and the extreme demands and long hours put on most game developers of that era. In memoriam of Ozono-san's passing, longtime employee Arai-san put it best. Technosoft experienced all the highs and lows of a video game developer in the 80s and 90s. There were trips overseas, but there were also years of recession when no one got a bonus. There were times when we'd hire a bunch of new employees all at once, and times when, out of the blue, a mass of people would quit. In the midst of all that tumult, the one constant was Ozono and his insistence on making good, quality games. In times of feast or famine, Ozono bore the responsibility, and I have now come to understand the weight of that lonely burden. My one regret is that I was never able to say all this to Ozono while he was in good health, but I will never forget the feeling of gratitude I have toward him. Without Tomio Ozono, the good and the bad, the known and unknown burdens only he would ever understand. The amazing company that was Technosoft would not have existed to all the genius that passed through Technosoft. We all owe a debt of gratitude, and for those who lived through that era, a part of our childhood. The most wonderful thing about retro gaming and the revival of the classics is that these masterpieces of gaming history continue to live on. We do our best to preserve the history so the talent of great developers like Technosoft and their games will never die with them. 
through new releases, emulation, articles and videos, we can share these amazing games with future generations, and hopefully one day fuel a resurgence of new games in the spirit of the old. That reality is looking brighter than ever. In 2018, M2 was hired to port Thunder Force 4 to the Nintendo Switch. A year later, Thunder Force 3 released on the Genesis and Mega Drive mini consoles. And most recently, in 2020, Thunder Force AC was re-released on the Switch as part of the continuing Sega Ages collection. Who knows what future releases and sequels may ensue. But what we do know is that as long as fans of Technosoft exist, the legacy will remain not only sharing the history, but the effect that these games had on every one of us will ensure future generations look upon these games as something they too want to experience. And if you're going to get a new generation of gamers excited about STGs, shooters, shooting games, shoot 'em ups and shmups, there are few better places to start than Technosoft and Thunder Force, one of the greatest shooting series of all time. And to celebrate the incredible talent from the earliest innovations to their greatest success to their final days, that made Technosoft one of the most important developers in gaming history.